Welcome to this Grattan Institute briefing. I'm Jordana Hunter, Director of Grattan's Education Program. I'm one of the authors of the new Grattan Report we're discussing today, Spreading Success, Why Australia Should Trial Multi-School Organisations, which we published on the 17th of March. I'm joined with my co-author, Nick Parkinson, who will also share some highlights from the report with you. We come to you today from the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations people whose traditional lands we all meet and work on and whose cultures are amongst the oldest in human history. Grant Institute is an independent, not-for-profit think tank. We're not politically aligned. Uh, We make practical recommendations to government that are evidence-based and we strive to be rigorous in our analysis. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll explain why we embarked on this project, what multi-school organisations are, how they differ from the existing uh, structures to support schools in Australia. And my co-author, Nick Parkinson, will then step through some examples of the opportunities that multi-school organisations make possible for school principals, teachers and students. And we will try our best to save some time to answer some of the great questions that you sent in when you signed up for the webinar today. And we'll also keep an eye on the chat function uh, as we go along. If you'd like to make any comments as well, we'll try our best. So why did Grattan embark on this project? Australia has many, many exceptional schools, principals and teachers, but we've also struggled to spread success to all 9,500 plus of those schools right around the country, which means that too many students are in communities where they're missing out on the opportunity to learn in a school that offers both excellence and equity. And a lot of survey evidence suggests that we're the way we've organised our schools is really taking a toll on principals and teachers and they're struggling. It's taking a toll on their wellbeing and affecting the attractiveness of the teaching profession. This is something that we're worried about at Grattan as we think all uh, educators and policymakers should be. At the same time, expectations on schools continue to grow, which further compounds the challenges that our principals and teachers face. Expectations now stretch from offering a rigorous academic curriculum while also building valuable life skills and providing students a rich set of life experiences, uh, supporting students' well-being, meeting complex health, psychological and developmental challenges, as well as managing what can sometimes be quite complex behaviour. For principals, there's also the responsibility of managing facilities and IT, recruiting and developing staff, and sometimes some quite complex budgeting work that they have to do. Now, expectations, particularly for students, are important. It's good that we have high expectations in Australia, but it does mean that running a highly effective school that delivers great outcomes for all students is operationally very challenging. This is the case for our very, very small schools, as of which we have many in Australia, as well as for our very large schools. We just rely too much on individual superhero principles, running highly effective standalone schools and improving struggling schools one by one. This is an ineffective model. It underutilises our most effective principals and teachers while also unfortunately burning many of them out. It doesn't provide enough targeted support to deliver on our high expectations, particularly for students who come from challenging contexts. And even when principals do deliver strong outcomes or turn around struggling schools, things can unravel very quickly when inevitably they move on. This led us at Grattan to wonder if the individual school really is the best unit, I guess, to meet the challenges we face to deliver genuine excellence and equity for all students. Are there better ways of organising schools? Several countries around the world, including Australia, have explored and experimented with different approaches over time. But one way uh, that really stood out to us as warranting further investigation internationally was the grouping of schools into formal multi-school organisations. So what are multi-school organisations? They are effectively strong families of schools united through shared executive leadership. Effective MSOs range in size in these families from about 10 schools up to 100, uh, but many of them are in that 20 to 40 school family size. This size gives them the capacity to meet expectations and tackle hard challenges, while also staying connected to each school's local context, which is really important. Effective MSOs develop a common blueprint for running great schools, and the coordination needed to enact that blueprint is hardwired into the formal bonds between schools and the executive leadership. Schools in MSOs can draw on substantial support from their head office, 
In addition to the administrative uh, administration and facility support, they often share curriculum and assessment materials and share the, the work involved in, in teacher recruitment and professional development, and it can be really targeted to their blueprint. MSOs can be integrated into the government sector, into the Catholic sector and the independent sector. And in fact, there are examples where MSOs have brought schools together across different sectors. The MSO model doesn't guarantee success. There are no magic wands in education, but it does improve the odds of school improvement and it can lead to some impressive results. Like all institutions with public funding and responsibility for supporting students, MSOs do need to be embedded in strong regulatory and policy frameworks and accountability frameworks. But where they are using the advantages of size and their governance structure and they're, they're using that effectively, there is good research to show that MSOs have delivered impressive results, particularly for students in disadvantaged communities and for struggling schools. Thanks, Nick. So how do MSOs compare to the standard ways of organising schools, particularly in Australia? So if we think about how they compare to standalone schools, uh, standalone schools are very close to their local context. They understand their communities well. And if they have a lot of school level autonomy, which many, many schools in Australia do, including inside the government school sector, uh, theoretically, they have the capacity to design approaches that can respond well to the particular needs of their community. But the problem is most individual schools lack the capacity, the organisational heft or the expertise to do this really, really well. And that when they do do it well, principals often report that it comes at a huge personal cost. And as I said earlier, success can be very hard to spread from one school to the other. Now, if we think about these big government departments or large Catholic dioceses, they're certainly big enough to have the organisational heft required to tackle some of these problems but they operate huge numbers of schools, often at least several hundred schools, up to thousands of schools. So in the case of New South Wales, around 2,200 government schools in Victoria, 1,600. Now, catering to so many schools in such very contexts can make it very hard for governments to provide practical support, let alone develop a fit-for-purpose detailed blueprint for running an effective school. We know departments also have uh, significant pressure to balance competing interests and avoid political risk, which can lead to conflicting policies and watering down advice. There are regional staff, particularly in our government school systems, that are intended to provide more local support, but they are also frequently stretched too thin. And in the more autonomous systems, they don't always have the authority or levers to drive real improvements. So we can see here that the multi-school organisation structure uh, is really a Goldilocks structure. They've got operational control of a manageable number of schools. They can know those schools intimately, but they've still got the capacity to tackle shared challenges. So one of the questions we get asked a bit, and uh, we've got a great question from uh, Gemma uh, Kerrison from New South Wales asked this as well, uh, was how uh, how multi-school organisations differ from informal uh, or, or formal peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, and, and I think this is a good question and there are some important uh, similarities but also some important differences. So certainly in Australia and overseas, schools are often grouped into loose collaborative peer-to-peer uh, -peer or principal or school-based networks, often geographically centred. Uh, and these do provide a really valuable forum for teachers and principals to share advice, problems of practice, and collaborate on areas of common interest. But unlike these peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, which uh, tend to be uh, more based on that, uh, you know, willingness to participate, MSOs have a much more formal governance structure. Uh, they're united under shared executive leadership, which really provides that strong basis for uh, decision-making, alignment, and deep collaboration. So in contrast to this, some of these peer-to-peer -peer networks, while they're valuable, uh, they do, as I said, rely on the individual willingness of schools to participate. And sometimes this can be hard to achieve, especially if nearby schools see themselves as competing for teachers or staff uh, or students. Uh, and often deeper professional collaboration can be hard to achieve if schools don't have enough in common. So if they're not using the same curriculum and pedagogy, for example, it can be very hard to structure really shared high value professional development that's tailored to teachers' needs. So we do see these as operating quite separately. Now, I think I've set up what MSOs are and why we did the project. I'm going to throw now to Nick, who's just going to talk through some of the opportunities in practice. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much, Jordana. And I'm really excited to take everyone here listening into some of the MSOs we visited and show what was possible thanks to the structure. 
First, though, I thought I'd explain a little bit about the, the sample that we visited. We visited six multi-school organisations and one organisation that was providing advisory support to a group of schools. Now, these MSOs, we selected them because they were really high performing and they were producing outstanding results, particularly for disadvantaged students in challenging contexts. One point to note is that for the most part, the schools that they run are government schools. So they are open enrollment fee free schools. And the schools within their families are at different points on their journey towards providing an exceptional education. Some of them are the strongest performing schools in the country when you look at the progress that students make in their learning. Some are schools that have struggled for decades and joined these MSOs to get a boost to how they were performing. And some are schools that were already good and they're being supported to become great. Another point to note is that while the models varied across these MSOs, the schools that we visited had a strong sense of connection to their local community. Just by way of example, in some of the MSOs, when schools joined, they retained their uniform, they had the same name, but they felt that they were part of something bigger, in some cases, a national MSO. So let's look a little bit about what we learned when we did these case studies of high-performing MSOs. The multi-school organisations we came to see were a powerful vehicle for school improvement. What's really quite nice about the model is a multi-school organisation it's a vehicle that is intended, its sole purpose is school improvement. They're authorised to run a group of schools and their mandate is to provide high quality, exceptional standards of education in that group of schools. Jordana mentioned before that they have this Goldilocks size and, and spoke a little bit about how that enables to do them, them to do a whole host of exciting things. So I'll touch on a few of these and then over the next few slides, what I want to do is provide some examples and add a little bit of light and colour to, to exactly what that looks like. The first thing to note is that they're able to have a blueprint for excellence and that blueprint goes into the operational detail of exactly what it takes to run a highly effective school. This meant we could be in conversations with leaders in MSOs and principals across different schools who shared a view about things as specific as how the school day ought to start, what a great geography curriculum looks like, how to group students into different classes according to what's going to best serve their needs, and the best type of screening instrument to use to test whether students entering at Year 7 um, might need extra support in their reading, for example. But it's not just that they have this specific blueprint. It's that they marry that precision of vision with the operational or organisational head needed to make it a reality. Take that example before of a great geography curriculum. As we'll see in a moment, multi-school organisations can harness the collective expertise and resources of a group of schools to actually produce a really outstanding geography curriculum. The other thing that they can do is because they have a shared governance structure and shared executive leadership, they can pull out manoeuvres to improve schools at pace that are quite hard without a structure like an MSO. Just by way of example, we visited many schools or several schools that for some time had been struggling, but when they joined an MSO, the MSO was able to use its Goldilocks structure to inject extra leadership capacity into that school. And not just any leaders, leaders who were trained and embedded in the way of running an effective school that was specific to that multi-school organisation. The other thing that's nice about the model is how MSOs get better with each school that they improve. So we spoke to leaders who'd over time refined and codified an effective model for improving a school. They knew what week one looked like, they had a view of what week two looked like, and they had mapped out what the first three or four years of school joining their family of schools, um, how the support that they would get when that, when that school was beginning its turnaround or improvement journey. So let's now look at some examples and touch on some of the themes that, that were really apparent to us through the case studies. The first thing is school leadership. So for those of you working in schools and those of you who are leaders, you will know that a highly effective principal can make all the difference in a school. That's what the research tells us. One study um, talks about how a really effective principal can boost student achievement by an additional seven months, up to an additional seven months in a single year. Multi-school organisations provide a platform to extend and enhance the impact of the country's most exceptional leaders, of which we have many. In Australia, a high-performing principal might move on to a bigger school and take on a new challenge, 
only to see their hard work at their previous school maybe unpicked or change direction. That principal might also take a role or move into a principal supervisor role, work for a department or become a consultant. But without an MSO model, it's hard for a principal to have direct impact on a group of schools that are under, under their leadership and impact the life chances of students in those schools. MSOs also create a clear talent pipeline by stitching together opportunities across a range of schools. So we met principals who'd had chances to be on fellowships, to do some comments on other schools that had a similar model for schooling. This created a softer landing for them when they became principals. We visited one school, for example, which had produced 10 principals over, over that school's really recent decade. And those principals had gone on to lead schools within that, that MSO. MSOs can also help principals with the administrative burdens they face. And you can see a quote on the right from um, one of the teachers in a New York City school we visited who said that their principal had so much more time to coach them because that principal was no longer worrying about what happens when the roof leaks or trying to secure high school placements for each and every student in their school. But it's not just the, the, the absolute burden of the workload. It's also about those really acute crises that principals, particularly in challenging schools, often find themselves in. We know from some survey data released last week by Monash through their Occupational Health and Safety Survey and Principal Wellbeing Survey that many principals in Australia are really struggling with some quite challenging contexts, whether that be some challenging situations with parents, staff or students. Principals we spoke to in MSOs felt like they had someone who had their back, which was particularly important if they were trying to change a school that had been struggling for some time now. And the final thing I'd note is that when there's principal turnover, which is a particular problem in disadvantaged contexts, MSOs can provide a model for ensuring stability and succession between continuous principals. So sorry, continuity between successive principals. What that means is that when one principal, for example, has to leave the school, the next principal can pick up where they left off because there's a through line in the improvement agenda. Students also benefit because MSOs can harness the collective wisdom of a group of teachers across a family of schools to provide really great academic experiences. What we have on this slide is just an example of a factor that was common across the MSOs we visited. All the MSOs have produced high quality curriculum materials specific to their instructional models and the exact type of curriculum that they, as an organisation, felt was going to best serve their students. Here we can see some examples from a year five science unit from United Learning, which is one of our English MSOs. This is quite different to Australia. Graben's own research finds that only 15% of teachers in Australia say they have access to high quality curriculum materials for all their subjects. And when we asked why, about three quarters said that having too few teachers for each subject was a problem at their school to developing high quality curriculum. MSOs can help that. They can resolve for that by using all the teachers, for example, of music in primary school across a family of schools to produce a great primary school music curriculum. Teachers also benefit from the high quality professional learning that's possible through the MSO model. Here we see an example from Star Academies, one of the English MSOs we visited. This is from its professional learning handbook. On the left, we have some primary curriculum excellence masterclasses. Because of STAR's organisational size, this Goldilocks size, it's able to offer professional learning in quite specific areas that a standalone school might find hard to offer. For example, modern foreign languages or design and digital technologies. The other thing that they can do for teachers is provide rich career pathways. We met, for example, teachers who were really passionate about improving inclusion and now had the chance to impact and do that across a group of schools with a specific leadership role allocated for, towards that. And the MSOs we visited also offered training for schools outside their immediate family of schools. They've been a powerful vehicle for training the next generation of teachers and offering accredited professional learning for teachers across the countries in which they work. So to finish off, and before I hand it back to Jordana, I wanted to speak a little bit about how multi-school organizations can make schools a safe and orderly learning environment for students. This is a real challenge for some schools, particularly schools that might be in challenging contexts or dealing with a complex student population. 
MSOs can use the, their Goldilocks structure and the coordination possible between their schools to spread excellent ways of making classrooms calm and purposeful learning environments. By way of example, Dixon's Academies Trust runs 17 schools in English, England's north. And these schools are some schools that some of the more challenging schools in the country. Dixon's has found over time ways of really helping classes and schools be places that are ready for learning. And one way they do this is through lineups. Now, lineups, they're, they're, there's nothing super fancy about it. What it involves is students lining up in lines and assembling before, before class time and being helped and assembled and escorted to their classrooms to be ready to learn. Now, this is, this is a strategy that takes a bit of time to embed. It's really hard to do without having seen it work. But what was special about the MSO model and what helped Dixon's do this is that in one of its turnaround schools, Dixon's Cottingley Academy, seven out of 10 of the teachers have worked at another Dixon school. So they knew what it looked like when lineups were working well and were able to implement it using that knowledge. They've since refined what this looks like. So new principals and new schools to Dixon's can learn from what happened at Dixon's Cottingley Academy. For example, there's videos now which show what effective transitions look like at Dixon's. There are micro scripts called Dixon's What To Do's, which teachers and principals can use when introducing lineups. There's also examples of assets and resources that a new principal can use when trying to communicate lineups or other behaviors or changes to the school community and to parents. So these are some of the examples of what we saw. I'll pass back over to Jordana now to talk about what we recommend from the case studies. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, that was really great. Now, look, um, those who are regular readers of Grattan Education uh, reports might be pleased to hear that this report just has one recommendation. Uh, we've kept it simple. Uh, and that is really that Australia should establish multiple trials of multi-school organisations in each state, territory and school sector. We think each state government jurisdiction and the larger Catholic diocese could trial around three or four MSOs each, uh, and that would give us a really uh, good foundation to learn from. Thanks, Nick. So in our report, we do set out some design principles that we recommend are used to inform these trials. Uh, and these principles are based on how multi-school organisations were introduced internationally and the research on what worked well and what could be done better. So I'm just going to emphasise a few of these now. And if you want to learn more, have a look at the report. So first off, uh, we think ideally each trial would build to around 10 schools in about a decade, but it would start small only with one or two schools and grow gradually. Now that first school should be a beacon school. And by what we mean there is that it's a high performing school. that's got a really uh, good, clear understanding of what it is about the school that makes it high performing and can capture that in a clear blueprint uh, for running an effective school and then learn how to tweak and embed that in additional schools as they join the MSO trial. And that's that adaptation point, adapting for local context is really important. Learning how to do that well is an important part of growing a successful multi-school organisation. So each trial should be led by an executive leader, such as a standout school principal, who has operational responsibility for the trial uh, MSO schools and is supported by head office staff. Each MSO trial should have enough autonomy that they can develop a strong blueprint for running an effective school, but this should be set against a rigorous oversight framework established by government that includes strong public evaluation. This is really important to get right. Uh, now, trial MSO should be expected to align, we think, on teaching and learning approaches, such as using shared curriculum materials and assessment data, as well as school support with back office functions, administration and HR, for example. But bringing uh, that, that capacity and governance structure uh, to bear in terms of looking at curriculum materials and assessment, I think, is a really important way to kind of get all of the benefits of the MSO structure for students. Now, trial MSO should be opt-in with schools volunteering to join. Uh, but we do think there's an opportunity for new schools in some of our growth corridors around Australia that are yet to be opened uh, to be earmarked to join a trial. And over time, trial MSO should be supported to take on some struggling schools to help turn them around. This has been uh, a very important and powerful feature of uh, MSOs internationally, providing that support to struggling schools. 
With these principles in place, we think the trials could provide a really solid foundation to test the benefits of multi-school organisations in the Australian context and learn from the success and challenges overseas while getting the right policy and governance guardrails in place. Now, I think we've got time for just maybe one or two questions. Uh, and uh, I'm going to throw maybe first to Nick. Now, Katrina Bowden, I hope I pronounced that correctly, she sent through a great question with a couple of parts to it. Uh, her question was, how would you find the right leader for an MSO and what are the lessons learned from MSOs which were not successful? Yeah, it's a great question. So thanks for sending that one through, Katrina. When we think about who the leaders of a trial MSO might be, I think we should remember that Australia has some exceptional principles who, with the right training, could certainly take on this mantle. That said, it is quite different running a multi-school organisation to an individual school or a standalone school. In other countries which have experimented this with this, and particularly in England, we'd met a lot of uh, leaders who had the opportunity to do some fellowships in MSOs internationally. So Future Leaders Program, for example, in England, that sent a bunch of leaders over to the US to see some of the best MSOs there and spend some time learning the ropes from leaders in that country. Australia could experiment with something similar. With the second part of that question, which was about... Um, how there are what we can learn from MSOs that were less successful. Mm. I think there's a few things. The first is that often these MSOs grew too quickly, and there's a real risk of that. And so it's important in the Australian context, particularly if we were to trial MSOs, that those grow incrementally, that they only support schools which they actually have the capacity to support. The other reason that sometimes MSOs fail was because of poor governance or poor uh, leadership decision-making. And ways that we can address this in the Australian context and that Gradden are recommending are to have really robust regulatory frameworks and clear expectations from governments. Trial MSOs should genuinely add value to their schools and there's a real role for governments to be clear in their expectations about what these MSOs ought to achieve, what they ought to align on, and the expectations, just as we would with any other public institution. Mm -hmm around integrity and good governance. Um, Jordana, I might throw one more question to you that we got um, from someone when they signed up, which was from Craig Simpson, who asked a question about what's it like for schools within MSO in terms of their independence or their sense of autonomy. Could you said, shed some light on that? Thanks, Nick. This is a great uh, question. And, you know, I think I, I want to start by saying this is a policy design choice for systems if they choose to set up uh, MSOs. Uh, but internationally, uh, we've also seen some different approaches um, between different MSOs. So I firstly just want to say, you know, MS as schools are always a part of their local community, and that's really important. Uh, they retain the, their identity based on their students, their teachers, the families that they're serving, you know, the physical geography, uh, the buildings, et cetera. So, so that's a really important thing to recognise. Um, but within that, uh, it is possible for schools to retain uh, a more formal sense of identity potentially through their uniforms, the name of the school, for example, uh, they can retain that while still being in an MSO. We heard a lot, particularly in England, about the concept of aligned autonomy. So this is the idea where uh, those uh, parts of how you might organise schools and support them that are best made across a whole family, things, for example, around shared curriculum materials and assessments, uh, shared professional development, that will be aligned across the schools. But decisions that are really best made at the local school level, and this might include, you know, the types of uh, clubs and experiences you offer students, you know, how you organise uh, parent-teacher interviews, for example, depending on the needs of the parent community, uh, that can really be left to the local level. It's also important that there's opportunities to innovate uh, and experiment with different approaches over time. And MSOs uh, do try hard on, for the most part to create those opportunities. Now, Unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap up. I would love to talk about this all day long, um, but I am going to bring us to a close. Uh, and I think Nick might try to answer that one or two questions while I, I finish my introductory comments, but please do reach out to us uh, if you've got more questions. We love to have that engagement uh, with our readers. Uh, I would really like to thank our funder, the Susan McKinnon Foundation, for their generous support of this project. All of our work is freely available on our website, so head to grattan.edu.au if you'd like to read more. And if you do like our research and you want to help us do more of it, please consider donating to support future Grattan reports, which you can also do from our website. So I am going to wrap up there. I'm going to let you get back to your day. Thank you so much for joining us.